All right, good afternoon or somewhere it is good morning. Uh, I hope everyone are doing well. Uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us to learn how to write a strong USDA SBIR STTR application. I am Nurun Nahar. I'm a program specialist in USDA Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer Program. On behalf of my fellow presenter, Dr. David Songstead, uh, he is having a little bit issue joining in. Hopefully he will join soon. Dr. Songstead and also the, uh, our program coordinator, Ms. Melinda Kaufman, our deputy director of Institute of Bioenergy, Climate and Environment, Dr. Kevin Keppard, we all welcome you to the USDA SBR STTR uh, Writing Strong Application Webinar. Dr. Keppard is our fearless leader and he guides us to all legislative rules and mandates and oversees SBIR STTR program. Dr. Keppard, would you like to introduce yourself and provide some opening remarks? Sure, thank you very much. It's my job today to just primarily give a welcome and more than that, a thank you for all of you for uh, joining in with us today, registering for this webinar and, uh, and for taking time to uh, learn about how to develop a very competitive and strong application for SBIR STTR. Again, my name is Kevin Kephart. I'm the Deputy Director for the Institute of Bioenergy, Climate, and Environment at USDA NEFA. I'm here today because that's a, a part of USDA NEFA that actually leads and oversees the SBIR STTR program on behalf of all of USDA, not, not solely for, for NIFA, but this is a USDA-wide wide program that we have here today. I do wanna give some thanks and recognition to our leaders in SBIR, STTR at, at, in NIFA that uh, I wanna uh, ask all of you to get to know, feel free to contact them and ask questions as you develop your applications. You'll be hearing today, you've already heard from Narun Nahar, but also Melinda Kaufman, she'll be visiting with you today. Dave Songstad is our lead NPL that we have, uh, national program leader that we have with SBIR. And we have some other folks as well that are uh, very important to the successful implementation of the program. That's Tammy Neville and uh, Leslie Vanderwood as well. And then uh, the division director, is Keith Harris. So all of those are important names for you as a, as a resource as you move forward. So again, thank you. Thank you very much. And I hope that this turns out to be a valuable webinar for you. I'll hand it back to Naran. Thank you, Kevin. Please mute yourself. I'm trying to unmute. I hear some of the noises. Uh, please mute so that you can listen better. Thank you. <clears throat> Melinda, can you confirm me that am I sharing the um, presentation slide mode? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So uh, let's start with our agenda, what we are trying to accomplish today. Uh, first of all, we're gonna um, try to do some of the introduction to the USDA SBR STTR program. Our introduction will be very brief. The reason is the first part of this webinar, we held a June 6th webinar, Introduction to Small Business Funding at the USDA. And that webinar um, has been posted with the recorded webinar and slides in our website. And I can share with you in the chat that recording so you will have a record. Uh, but today I'm gonna just go a little bit uh, review of that one. So we all are in the same page because I know that some of the people I see here have not joined on June 6th one. So um, I'm gonna just share in the chat that options. So you will see that previous recorded webinar. And then uh, more of, uh, mostly we're gonna uh, focus on how to kind of a write a strong application, SBIR, STTR application. And I'm happy to see that Dave uh, Sunstead probably resolved the issue of joining and then he is here right now. So we're gonna do a couple of different way. Um, 
we need to write a strong application for sure, but there are some steps that you need to be aware and do it before even you start your application. I'll go through with those. And Dr. Sonsted will talk about how to build a strong application and building a strong application, understanding the evaluation criteria mm -hmm. of your application is really important. So we need to follow those other key information that would be really helpful for you to know and use in terms of once you are building your strong application, some of the resources will be shared with you. And at the end, hopefully 30 minutes will leave for Q&A. So we'll go through all of your question and answer and we'll try our best to answer. It. So let's go back quickly to the uh, introduction of the SBR STTR program. Every agency that has a SBIR program or SBIR STTR program, they have really a specific mission. For our USDA SBIR uh, STTR program, specific mission is to support US agriculture and rural communities. So we really focus on the main part, the small business. So small business is the key component for our program. We really think that they uh, we they work with the research and development, different sorts of cooperative agreement, and then focus on innovation. That innovation should achieve the commercialization and finally go to the market. That is our goal. So the program goal, if we kind of a, uh, say it formal way, what are our program goals? There are four goals. One is the strengthening the role of the small business. That's our key. The second is increase the commercialization of that innovation that we talked about. Number three, foster and encourage participants by historically underserved population and stimulate technological innovation in the private sector. That's overall goal. And looking at that general scope, all those keywords that we put, you can see that market is our main final goal but we really focus on the center, small business, and that kind of a squirrel around the innovation, research and development, patent analysis, and all those. I'm sharing here different technology area that are supported by USDA SBR STTR program. I'm really happy to let you know that it is really, really broad. Uh, we define agriculture with a big A, not a small A, a big A. So it is not limited to crops and cows or cows and plows that some people think agriculture about. We actually cover from the education to AI, uh, artificial intelligence in our 10 topic areas and our broader topic areas are covering a lot of different technologies areas. We deal with information technology, remote sensing, mission vision, uh, machine vision, precision agriculture, uh, material encoding, nanotechnology, sensors, AI. So you can see that full of science and technology are part of USDA SBIR STTR program. We do have 10 topic areas and we really welcome you to think about submitting a proposal or application to our program. If you have any great ideas that fit in any of the 10 topic areas, uh, you can see in the slide here, we have forest and related resources, plant production and protection, engine uh, biology, and also we do have plant production and protection engineering, that's two, animal production and protection, conservation of natural resources, food science and nutrition, rural and community development, aquaculture, biofuels and bio-based products, small and mid-sized farms. Now, those 10 topic areas are really broadly defined. We really wanted it purposefully so that we can cover a lot of different topic of innovation in our program. So we encourage you, if you have any innovative ideas in any of those areas, please think about submitting an application for SBIR STTR program. For submitting the application, you have to be eligible, right? So we, I'm gonna go through a little bit about the eligibility because some people ask us that they are interested but not quite sure, sure if they are eligible. So understanding the SBR STTR eligibility is really, really important. So three main uh, topic focus, I will ask you to kind of think about eligibility. One is the you have to be a small business. To apply for small business and innovation research, it has to be a small business. 
Now, if you ask me, what is small business? Small business is a business which does not have more than 500 employees. It could be at least one employee that is still a small business, but cannot exceed 500, including any sorts of affiliation. So if you have a business that has one to 500 people, you are eligible as a small business. That's the first one. The second point is that business has to be for-profit entity. A lot of nonprofit organization ask, can they apply? Sorry, nonprofit organization are not eligible to apply. So keep in mind, it has to be small business and it has to be for-profit organization uh, to apply. Now, some of the research institution apply under the STTR program. I'll go through the STTR once we are getting there, but that is different. Still, small business has to be for-profit uh, uh, organization. And the third point I listed that, that business, uh, that independent small business has to be within the United States. More than 50% has to be owned and controlled by US citizen or permanent resident. So three things to keep in mind, must be operating in the US, proposed research that you are planning to do, it has to be done in the US, and more than 50% owned and controlled by a US citizen or a permanent residence. If you have a joint venture, each party to joint venture must be a concern that satisfy all the program eligibility. So that's another criteria that you need to meet. So I'm, I'm hoping that you now at least understand what is the criteria to be eligible to apply for this program. Think about these three components to be eligible. Now, um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of sort of synopsis. What are our programs are um, and what are the budget amount or the duration? Annual budget for SBR STTR programs for this year around $42 million. So the intention of the USDA program is to support scientific excellence and technological innovation. And that is done through the investment of federal dollars to build a strong national economy by the, by the small business. So there are three phases of SBIR STTR program, phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase one basically focus on technical merit or the feasibility. Uh, if you have a great idea, you are not quite sure it's going to work or not work, that is a good chance for submitting a phase one application because you are not quite sure how great is your idea is, is it going to work? So that feasibility testing should be in the phase one. Phase one uh, budgeted for 125000 to 175000 uh, We do have two program area. 8.6, that's a, a rural development area, and then 8.12, small and mid-sized farm. Those two topic area, you can use a existent of the shelf technology. So amount is a little bit less, 125,000. Rest of the area focus on the new innovation. So that's why it is considered 175,000. So that's the budget. And duration for SBIR program, the durations are eight months, while STTR program, the duration is 12 months. The difference is a little bit more for STTR because we understand that for STTR, you need to have a collaborative, cooperative agreement with uh, another university or the federal lab that require a little more time. So that's why STTR requires 12 months. So that's our phase one. Uh, any small business are eligible, if you are eligible that I previously mentioned, you are eligible to apply for phase one. Phase two is a little bit restrictive. Only phase one awardee who successfully completed their phase one, they are eligible to apply for phase two. So that's only one caveat that no one can directly apply to phase two. They, has to, they have to always go through phase one. Phase two duration is 24 months for SBR STTR program and the budget is 600,000. Uh, phase two actually is expanding the phase one research and development area and scientific and technical merit still an important criteria, but you're going to still want to focus more on commercial potential in the phase two. So this is the main criteria for phase two. In terms of budget, I just mentioned the uh, base budget, but there are additional budget. For phase one, there are 6,500 technical uh, uh, it's called TABA, Technical and Business uh, Assistance. And then for phase two, 50,000 additional money involved for technical and business assistance. 
For phase three, keep in mind that USDA SBIR program does not really provide any funding for phase three, but uh, phase three, we, we kind of always encourage our phase two awardee to secure funding from any private, public, and state resources and investment to enable their commercialization and continue their commercialization effort on phase three to go to the market. Uh, so this is, you need phase three to go to the market. Sometimes you can skip it, but most of the time you needed that phase three to go to the market. Uh, we encourage to do that, but we really do not have money to provide funding for phase three. Now I, I kept saying SBIR, STTR, and then you will hear me another, um, another key word is both. Both meanings you can apply Three, day, three different way in our program. You can choose SBIR, you could choose STTR, or you could choose both. Both meanings SBIR and STTR. And what are the difference and which program is right for you? There are four different criteria that you're gonna look at to find out which one is right fit for you. So the first one is, do we need any nonprofit research institution or federally funded research and development center participation? Meaning, does your small business require collaborate with the federal lab or the university? For SBI program, this is optional. You may want to bring one partner from the university or federal lab. If you apply for STTR, this is a must. You have to have a um, partnership with the federal lab or the university folks. So STTR that require a must, both also is a must for, uh, for this requirement. Now, how much participation you need for the folks from university or the federal lab? That also varies depending on which program you choose. If you choose for uh, SBIR program, for phase one, it has to be 33% or less participation from university or other research development center. If you apply for phase two, then it could go up to 50%. For STTR, this participation really ranges high. It is 30 to 60%. So if you need really more help in terms of testing, uh, data analysis and all those things, your participation could be higher once you pair up with university folks and then STTR, it allows up to 60% that uh, participation. In both category, it is a small, sweet category in between two. Look at that, STTR start at 30% participation, SBIR start at 33% participation. So this sweet spot, 30 to 33%, that is covered once you choose both. Once you are doing application, you could choose and mark both, and depending on our funding source and funding availability, we could see which program it fits better, either SBIR or STTR. So our applicant has that capacity to choose both options. Another key difference is the primary employment of the principal investigator, or we call PI. For PI, SBIR program must be employed with the small business for both option must be employed with the small business as well. But for STTR, it is little bit different. It may be employed with either small business or nonprofit research institution, meaning either university or federal lab. So I see a lot of good opportunities for the STTR program for our university folks to pair up with small business and apply for our program. Another key difference is the cooperative agreement. It's a formal cooperative agreement for SBIR program. It is not required because SBIR program may not have any participation from the university. For STTR, this is a required one. Formal cooperative agreement is required. For both option, it is also required. So I'm hoping that this gives a general guidance for your proposal, how you want to write the proposal, what kind of help you need, who are the participant or, or sort of a co-investigator for your application to decide on which one would be better fit for you. Let's go a little bit deep on the SBIR, STTR, uh, university and government scientists involvement. For SBIR program, scientists may serve as a consultant or receive a subcontract and continue to work full-time at their home institution. 
but there is a limit. It is limited to no more than one third of the phase one and half of the phase two award. That's the limitation. Also, scientists may serve as a PI, principal investigator, by reducing employment at their home institution to 49% of the duration of the grant. That is a second op option. Finally, usually not acceptable for university or government scientists to serve as consultant and have all the research done in their lab. So this is basically done for SBR program. Let's go to the STTR program. For STTR program, the PI or principal investigator can be employed with the small business or the research institution. That's a great flexibility for STTR program. Keep in mind, the small business must perform 40% of the work proposed in the project. Uh, the research institution perform at least 30% of the research and development. The other 30% can be out, outsourced with the other research institution or another subcontractor. So that 40, 30, 30 uh, division for our STTR program. So that gives a lot of flexibility for small business to work with the university uh, folks or the federal lab to pair up and give a lot of responsibility and get done their research. We hear some confusion around STTR, some thinking that, oh, university or nonprofit research institution or federal lab are eligible to apply. So they can be a PI or they can be a applicant or awardee. These are all misconception. We want to clear that up. This is a small business innovation research, small techno business technology transfer program. So the key, um, he is small business. So applicant must be a small business. No research institution or individual is applicant. And also award goes to small business, not any research institution or individual. But uh, depending on SBIR, STTR program, you can pair up with different groups of people, but keep in mind, small business are gonna be always the applicant and they are the ultimate award. Now going through before you start your application, uh, there are a couple of things uh, you need to be really clear what, uh, how, how to prepare to apply. And before you when you have a great idea or start writing or have different ideas, start writing the application. I think that I'm gonna point out three key things to remember. One is review the solicitation. I cannot uh, emphasize enough at this point that uh, always, always read the request of application. We call that RFA truly, because all the pertinent information regarding what needs to be done on your application, how to get done, evaluation criteria, everything actually listed in the RFA. So RFA is the key, really good key. Reviewing RFA, uh, always making that a key documents for writing your application, uh, should be your priority, review the solicitation or RFA. Second is determine the topic area. Uh, you cannot use one application for multiple topic area. Select the topic area, area that aligns best with your project. Now, you might have some ideas. You, you are not maybe sure that if it right fits for a particular topic area, we are here to help our national program leaders for all topic areas. You can share with them your ideas, writing just two paragraph and send them um, your uh, writing and then uh, ask for a solicitation for 20 minutes and then you can um, brainstorm which way it's gonna be better. Also, Dr. David Sonsted in our program national, pro uh, overall national program leader, he always guide our applicant which topic area would be right fit for your innovation. So please always uh, be in touch with us. Now, before the submission of your application, you have to go through a lot of the registration process. There are key three registration process that you have to go through, and I will be sharing with you in here what are those key three registration. The first one is SAM.gov registration. It is important for setting up a SAM.gov account. This is called entity registration. It is a mandatory one for you to get a federal fund to obtain a unique entity identifier number, or it's called UEI. It's a 12-digit alphanumeric identifier that is required for all federal government um, 
to getting fund or contract or anything. So you need to have that done. If you have already registered through SAM.gov, keep in mind that you need an annual update. Annual update is a requirement. So if you have done last year, please renew that one. And I am sharing with your slide all those um, link for the registration. Keep in mind, there is no fee to register or renew at SAM.gov. If you see that any sorts of monetary involvement there, refresh your screen, it shouldn't be asking for any sorts of fee. Now, once you have that UEI from SAM.gov, you must return to grants.gov to continue your registration. That, that is the second one. And you have to click on the applicant tab in here, once you click on the applicant tab, you will find applicant registration under the applicant resources. And a, you can create a grants.gov account with the same email address as you used in the same sam.gov. Once you are trying to create your account, add a profile with the grants.gov using the same UEI obtained from sam.gov. Uh, if you are confused, you need some help. Detailed instructions are available in the user guide for grants.gov. So this is the second important one. Once you have grants.gov sign up, you need to come back and do the third and last one that is sbir.gov registration. This is five steps registration using the information. You have to use the UI. Remember that you unique um, identifier number you receive during the sam.gov, exactly same one you will be using. Use your email address, sam.gov points of contact, your company name address, ownership, number of employees, and points of, uh, points of contact. SBR.gov actually um, identify if you are a small business or not. And you have to get done the SBR.gov registration to be eligible to apply for SBIR and STTF program. So these are all the registration you required before you start your application. It requires time. So that's the reminder that please remember the SAM.gov registration process can take up to 10 days. Um, so stay uh, start early. All those entity, uh, if you are registered, everything, make sure that your annual renewal is updated uh, before the submission. So that's the reminder for your registration, but I'm gonna go back to Dr. Songstead um, to discuss how to prepare your strong application. Okay, thanks, Naren. Uh Let me just give a little introduction to myself. Uh, sorry for joining late. You know, sometimes Zoom doesn't always cooperate. So I'm, I'm glad I'm here though. Uh, for me, uh, most of my career was in the private sector, and I've worked for large companies, and I've worked for small companies, and I actually started a company. So I know what it's like to be an entrepreneur applying for grant funding. I've been in your shoes. So from that standpoint, I'd like to discuss with you, from my perspective, uh, what it takes to write a really strong grant application. So the next slide, please. So as Nuren mentioned, SBIR is Small Business Innovative Research. So that's why Innovative Ideas appears first here. Your application needs to describe something that's new, something that's novel, something that is just a game changer in terms of agriculture. And it this will really give traction you know, in terms of your application for the, the panel reviewers, when they read something that just totally stands out from everything else that's out there. And we do entertain high risk and high reward applications. So we, we actually fund all, you know, aspects of risk and reward, but we do entertain high risk, high reward applications. And the reason why is sometimes those crazy ideas turn out to be real. So keep that in mind. The commercial impact, you know, how will your technology impact society? What's the market reach that you anticipate? You need to communicate that 
in your application. Nuren did a good job going over the, the budget limitations. <clears throat> the thing I want to emphasize is don't exceed these because if you do, the show is over. You, your application will not be reviewed if you apply for more than 125,000 for those two topic areas that she mentioned or 175,000 for the other eight. If you exceed the, the budget requirement, budget limitations for the topic area of your interest, you're not gonna go very far. And then um, the focus on research. Phase one applications are totally about proof of concept. Now, you might be starting from the very beginning, like high risk, high reward, where you don't have any preliminary data, or you might do have some preliminary data. Both are equally uh, acceptable. And But the key point here is you need to describe the experiments in the key experiments. And I, I generally think key experiments like the three to five key experiments that need to be done to show what proof of concept exists for phase one. And of course, phase one awards are required before you can be invited to apply for phase two. I know other agencies like NSF have it a different way, but we have it in a stepwise format, phase one and phase two, with phase one being first. Next slide. Let's talk about the key factors of success. We've already talked about the importance of an innovative idea. Strong agreements are also important. I'll be talking more about a CRADA, and a CRADA stands for a Cooperative Research and Development Agreement. We'll touch on that later on. But if you are applying for STTR funding, you're gonna have to have the technology transfer agreement in place with the nonprofit institution that you're licensing that technology from, a signed agreement. So that's you know important too. If there's any other agreements that are in place, like for consulting, it's good to have all that documented. The business expertise. Sometimes entrepreneurs that are getting started may not have the funds to have a CFO hired. Well, it's okay to hire someone as a part-time CFO, like a consultant. So it's important to have someone on your team that can handle the, the business side of things early on. You know, in terms of business, now keep in mind, phase one is not about, you know, the commercialization of the technology, it's about proof of concept, but it's important to communicate that market opportunity in phase one. Letters of support are always valued by the, the panel reviewers. They like to read those. Now, don't overwhelm the application with too many. I've seen some applications where there's 20 letters of support and, and that's too much. So stick with about the two or the three key letters of support that are most impactful. And you'll know who to, to ask to get those letters. It could be a potential um, funder of the technology. It could be a, a customer. It could be, you know, someone that you even license the technology from. So, you know, you'll know who to ask to get, to get those letters. <clears throat> then, of course, the market knowledge. And I touched on that in terms of the business expertise to communicate the uh, clear understanding of how you plan to enter the market. What's the market opportunity for to justify the phase one application. Next slide. There are application fundamentals. Now, Nuren did a good job, you know, emphasizing you need to read the RFA. And I'm gonna back her up on that because it's really important. You need to read the RFA. So you might ask, well, what's the difference between SBIR and STTR? Well, the RFA will get into the differences. You know, all the different questions that might come about, you know, when's the, the due date for applications, who's eligible, just any question that you could might might come to mind after this webinar, you can go to the RFA and, and there's a good chance that the answer will be there. If not, this is only the beginning of our conversation because we have uh, national program leaders associated with all 10 topic areas. Their contact info is provided in the RFA where you could reach out and ask for a, a visit. 
and they would be more than welcome to, to talk with you to answer any questions. So again, read the RFA. That's a starting point. Next question. There we go. Become a student of the RFA. And I'm sharing that from firsthand experience back when I started my small business. The RFA is your roadmap. Um, on the right-hand side here is a, a snapshot of what the RFA looks like. And in, when we talk about an RFA, it's the request for applications. And it's you, you'll learn that the main goals of the program, uh, you know, of course, we provide different uh, technical assistance webinars, like the one that you're participating in right now. And it's also uh, allows you to understand the instructions outlined in the uh, RFA to assemble a strong proposal. Again, read the RFA. It's the, the most important thing you can really learn from this webinar. And let's see. Uh, and the uh, also, you could Google the NIFA grant application guide. You put that into Google, NIFA grant application guide, and it will pop right up. And it'll give you some more guidance in terms of writing applications. So I encourage you to look at that too. Next slide. I also want to include Dave. Once they read the RFA, RFA will have the link for grant application guide as well. Okay, perfect. So the structure of the um, of the RFA, there's eight main parts to the, the RFA. There's the executive summary, and then the funding opportunity description, the award information, eligibility, the application and submission information, application review requirements, and award administration and other information. So again, you can go to the RFA to get this information. Next slide. There are certain things that are required in your application. The summary is a requirement. And we'll talk a little bit about, about the summary uh, later on. The project narrative is also a requirement. And that's the body of your application. The budget, as we've talked about already. And there's also a foreign disclosure form, which is something that's relatively new. It came with the 2022 uh, reauthorization of SBIR. This is a, a congressional requirement for uh, SBIR going forward. Other necessary items are the, the bio sketches of the key personnel, the uh, budget justification. If there's any conflicts of interest, they need to be disclosed. Current and pending support, the, your bibliography, the request for TABA funding can be included. Yeah, a valid small business concern number, which is the unique entity identifier. And uh, of course, you need to provide documentation of any prior phase one awards or pending applications where you've requested funding. Next slide. Before I go to the next slide, I also want to emphasize that if you are missing any of the required documents, after the administration review, it will not go to the panel. It's automatically just dropped off. So you will be losing the peer review panel application will not be considered. So keep in mind required meaning, you have to have those in your application. Yeah, and, and again, read the RFA. And Nuren's right, if there is a required element that's missing, it won't go forward. So what's included in the project summary? A recent change that we had is to limit this to 250 words. So make sure you take note of the, the, the word uh, limitation. So have it 250 words or less. And the best way to really compare this 250 word project summary is in my mind is kind of like, you know, the, the elevator pitch. You know, if you're in the elevator and you're with the, you know, the, the president of the company and you got 30 seconds to, you know, visit, you want to have the most important things that come to mind to share. And just like in this case here, you want to capture the reviewer's attention with the project summary. So describe the, the problem in a way that's very concise, 
but impactful. You only have one paragraph to get this done, so use your words uh, succinctly and um, provide the key information to really get their attention, but don't disclose any confident confidential information. Next slide. The project narrative. This has a 17 page limitation. Don't exceed it. If you exceed it, your application will not be reviewed. So keep it at 17 pages or less. And the key questions to answer is how does your application align with the USDA SBIR STTR program priorities? And how is the, the program that the problem that you're identifying, why is it important? What's the background information you can give and the the technical information and you know that you can convey to really highlight this as being unique and novel and and what are the market needs and what results do you expect? What benefits do you anticipate? And in any, you know, anything that could be of value in terms of describing um, your application. Um, I want to jump to the, the work plan. In my mind, the work plan is really the science plan. And this is the most important part of your narrative. This is where you describe those key experiments that need to be done to show proof of concept. And they need to be described in a way where you can convince the panel reviewers, that these are very, very well thought out. So I encourage you, for each experiment, describe your treatments, describe your control. I've actually seen some applications where there's no control, and those don't go very far, so include your control. Describe the experimental design you're planning to use for each experiment. Describe your response variable. What are you measuring? Describe how many times you're going to replicate the, the treatments and the controls in each experiment. And describe what statistics you're going to use to determine if there's any significant difference among the, the treatments and the control. This needs to be done to totally convince the panel reviewers that you've completely wrapped your head around these experiments. And it gives them the confidence that it's well thought out and do that for each and every experiment in your uh, research plan, in your science plan. That's so, so important. And then um, describe if there's any research efforts that are directly related to your project and how your application could impact in a positive way these different research areas. And has your project... Uh, Describe your you know market potential for your uh, application and and who are your customers or potential competitors. So this is you know more on the uh, the very beginning of the uh, the commercial side. Next uh, slide. For some of you, you may have already applied for phase one funding and unfortunately received notification that you didn't you know, receive funding. So you're encouraged to reapply. And I want to, uh, you know, let you know that you're not alone because we have about a 15% uh, award frequency. So 85% of the applications are, um, do not receive funding. With resubmission though, you do receive the verbatim feedback from the reviewers and also the panel summary. So that's very, very valuable feedback to have because you're also encouraged to resubmit. And when you do so, you're given one extra page. In addition to the 17 page narrative, you're given one extra page to address the previous panel's concerns that came out during the review process. So you can address them to the, the current panel that's re uh, reviewing your resubmission, how you address those concerns. And I can attest that the panel does pay attention to that. And again, that one extra page does not count towards a 17 page uh, narrative limit. So we do re-encourage resubmission. 
So tips for a project narrative. Provide a comprehensive information in your application. This is, in my mind, the science plan is, you know, number one here. Write your proposal logically and clearly. Do it in a way where you can clearly communicate the, the points you want to get across. And you can use tables and figures to help illustrate important points. But I want to stop here because your tables and figures will take up space in that 17 page narrative. So use your figures in tables wisely. For example, if you're, you know, my favorite crop is, is corn. I, that's what I worked with in my entire career. So if you want to do something with corn, you probably don't want to have a photo of a corn plant because most people already know what a photo of a corn plant looks like. So I would suggest not doing that, but focus on the information that can really add to, you know, the proposal that uh, you want to uh, identify. And remember the four C's, be compelling, clear, concise, complete when you want to convey your message. And if you have other folks on board with your small business, have them review what you wrote. It's always good to have other people read and critique before you submit the application. So I encourage you to do that as well. Next slide. So prepare the budget with strong justification. Again, don't exceed the budget. That's a, a big no-no. And I want to uh, expand upon one of the points that Nuren made. And, and I saw one question about um, the, uh, the budget in terms of you know, how the budget can be uh, uh, outsourced. And for example, with SBIR, up to 33% of the award can be used for subcontracts. So it could be zero, but a maximum of 33%. Whereas STTR, assume, you know, since this is going to involve collaborating with a nonprofit institution, it's assumed that there's going to be subcontracting involved and it begins at 30% and goes up to 60% for, uh, for STTR. And the, the sweet spot between the two, as Nuren uh, mentioned earlier, is that 30 to 33% range that covers both SBIR and STTR. And that's the range, if you want to apply for both, that's the uh, the subcontracting rate you need to fall within. Now, keep in mind, if you do apply for both SBIR and STTR, you're only getting one award. You can't get two. It's only one award. It's either going to be SBIR or STTR, and that will be up to the, the review process when that falls out. The salaries uh, for the, the key people need to be really clearly stated. So, you know, don't have it as employee one, employee two, employee three. Have, you know, the, the names of the, the person uh, included and also the requested uh, salary. Um, there's other things, fringe benefits, you know, all the other things tied in with uh, the budget that needs to be included. And there's also an opportunity for uh, a fee for profit, which is allowable, which is uh, capped at uh, 7%. Next slide. So what to include as additional forms? I talked about the letters of support. Make sure you include those. The um, Describe the facilities and the instrumentation that you have available. In other words, describe your lab. How much lab space do you have? What equipment do you have within your lab or where you have access to if it's a, a shared facility, such as a, at an incubator or whatever it might be? Because this will be part of the criteria that's used by the panel to determine if you have the, the facilities and the equipment to get the job done. Include the bio sketches of the key personnel, budget justification, subcontract information if it's needed, and uh, any uh, conflict of interest that, that need to be uh, disclosed and the current and pending uh, applications for funding. So next slide. 
All right, I'm gonna just stop a little bit here, Dave, to you, just to mention that there are two requirements that other program and other agency wants that we do not require for SBRS TTR program. One is matching fund. You do not need to have a matching fund to apply for SBRS TTR program. And the second one is no data management plan is required. So these are the two things you do not need to pay much attention, but we listed all the additional forms that has to be done. Okay, very good. Next slide. So um, preparing your SBIR, STTR application, understanding the evaluation criteria. This is important for you to understand. So the review process. On the left-hand side, you can see a container full of, of the circles. And in the review process, the panel uh, in each of those blue circles represents a grant application the panel review process will rank those from highest on way down based on the on how the panel feels through consensus the how they uh, ranked in terms of uh, of the overall uh, quality of the application and meeting the review review criteria now the panel is composed of panelists from academia industry nonprofits and even from federal labs, but no one from NIFA is involved with any of the panels. And so we get a good mix and the mix comes from across the country and you know a very, very diverse uh, mix of, of panelists to do the application reviews. And the applicant will receive verbatim copies of the reviews as I mentioned earlier. And the, um, the phase one applicant, uh, who are not selected for funding are encouraged to, to reapply, as I mentioned earlier, with that one extra page to include, uh, to address the reviewer's comments. And phase two applicants are able to apply uh, only one time. So keep that in mind for the future. If you do get a phase one award, when it comes around to phase two, you have one shot on goal and, and there's no chance to do a resubmission for phase two. Next slide. So the evaluation criteria at the top is the science and technical feasibility. That's why writing a strong science plan is so important because that's the top criteria that's in the uh, evaluation pro uh, process here. It's followed by the market potential to ensure that there is reason within the market to, uh, to consider this. The importance of the problem, the investigator and resource qualifications. In other words, does the, 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 the project director and those involved with the application, do they have the background to get the job done? The budget, does it seem reasonable? And is there any duplication? And that's where, you know, duplication is important that the, uh, the applicant self-disclose that. If there are similar applications that have been submitted to other agencies, they have to be self-disclosed. So if there's similar applications within the USDA, they have to be self-disclosed too. So it's it's expected that the applicants will self-disclose. Next slide. So evaluation criteria number one, the science and technical feasibility. Make sure that you clearly describe the, the uh, project objectives and the outcomes. Make sure that you describe an innovative approach that's original, it's novel, it provides that new approach to agriculture that no one else has described. And clearly state the expected results in a, in a smart manner, smart being specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. And I want to emphasize time-bound because we're talking about eight months worth of funding for SBIR, 12 months for STTR. I've seen some applications fail because the applicant describes way too much and the panel realizes that there's no way they're gonna get it done. 
in an eight to 12 month time period. So don't do that. Focus on the critical experiments that can be done within that limited amount of time. So don't fall into that trap. And also, uh, does your project fill critical knowledge gaps that are then describe why? And uh, the background research, is there any uh, preliminary research that's been done? You know, this is a, the time to share it and make sure you have a, an adequate uh, literature review that backs up your application as well. And do you have the facilities, the equipment and the expertise to get the job done. So that's, you know, one of the important uh, criteria for uh, phase one. Next slide, the market potential. Now, describe the, the marketable outcome of your project in, in a way on how the value it can deliver to society and the value it can deliver to agriculture. And go through and identify that you have a clear understanding of your target market and that your team uh, has the technical and the business skills capable of taking it forward. If you have, if you do receive the phase one award to take it forward on to, uh, um, to phase two, if you're invited to apply and have your, um, if you've been successful at commercializing a product previously, make sure you make that well known that you do have a track record for taking things commercial. And if you've uh, talked with stakeholders, see if they can provide letters of support, see if they can you know, give you insights on how to further justify your application to receive funding. Next slide. The importance of the problem. Describe why your application is addressing an important aspect of American agriculture. Describe why it's in the public interest to have your application funded and describe why your application helps achieve any of the following goals in this slide. How does it address sustainable agriculture? How does it address the protection of natural resources and the environment? How does it create a safe and nutritious food supply? Does it help promote biofuels and bio-based products? And does it help with the enhanced global competitiveness of American agriculture? And does it help out the economics and the livelihood of those living in rural communities? So that's part of the importance of the problem. Next slide. The investigator and in resource qualifications. So describe the key members and what are their roles and describe. Now the, the panel reviewers are going to determine if the key members have the right expertise on the science or the business side. So make sure you have the right people involved and that they are described in, in the, the right manner to be very, very convincing. And do you have the resume for the project director with relevant work experience? Make sure that the project director that is submitting the application, as well as the authorized representative that's involved as well, have the work experience and, and have the are the best ones for submitting that application. And make sure you have the sufficient yeah, no, no, no. personnel. Yeah, could someone mute there? There we go. Uh, have the sufficient uh, personnel, facilities, and instruments to get the job done. And also, um, how do you plan to manage the project you know, if you receive the award? And now we've talked a little bit earlier about a CRADA, and I'd like to expand upon this in, in the next slide where a CRADA stands for a Cooperative Research and Development Agreement. And a CRADA is nothing more than a sheet of paper. It's an agreement. When I started my company, I had a CRADA with a federal lab. And all what it is, it's an agreement between the entrepreneur with the small business 
to partner with a federal lab to use federal resources, which includes equipment at the federal lab and expertise as well to help achieve the, uh, the positive outcome with the objectives in the SBIR application. So it's a good thing for entrepreneurs to consider having a CRADA. And it's, uh, it, you know, and so there's, it could be a USDA lab. The, the CRADA that I had was with Oak Ridge National Lab. So it could be a national lab. You know, it, it's up to you to find the federal researchers that might be in alignment with your, uh, your interests as an entrepreneur. So the CRADA has um, several factors that tie in with uh, the review process. We First of all, they're viewed very positively within uh, USDA SBIR, and we call it all actually our tiebreaker. So imagine we're at the end of the day, we have enough funding for one more application, and we have two that were scored equally, one with a CRADA, one without. Well, since they're scored equally, the one with the CRADA will get the funding. So it's our tiebreaker. So keep that in mind. Um, and finally, uh, uh, the budget. Uh, keep your your uh, budget within you know the the limitations that are um, uh, outlined in the RFA. Don't exceed them because that'll be a showstopper if you do. And provide a detailed breakdown on how you plan to use the funds. That's what the whole budget section is about. And duplication. So is your project original or and, and show that it has not been conducted by you or a, a different entity? And because we're looking for original novel uh, applications and, and, and indicate on how it's unique from others. And again, it's important to self declare disclose if you're submitting duplicate applications to the USDA or other agencies. So USDA is not the only organization within the federal government that offers SBIR. Department of Energy does, NSF does, Department of Defense. It goes on and on and on. There's multiple agencies that have SBIR. So from time to time, entrepreneurs might submit you know, similar applications to different agencies. They're not the same, but similar. But it's important that you self-disclose that. That's part of the application process. And it's expected that you do that. So next slide. So I'll hand All it right. back to Miran. All right. Thank you, Dev. I think that you shared a lot of critical information that is really important to keep in mind once they are writing the strong application, especially the going through the evaluation criteria. I'm going to go through some other key information that is really critical for your uh, application to be going through the review process. So it, it looks like not much important, but it is really important. Uh, the reason we see that every year around 17% application decline because they do not meet the formatting guideline or other guidelines. So I'll go through those critical components that you need to really pay attention. Keep in mind that all the application documents must be in portable document format or PDF. So we do not accept anything except uh, the PDF format uh, in NIFA. If you go to the grants.gov, grants.gov may allow other formatting, but NIFA does not. So keep in mind any document, Excel, Word document, our system cannot read that. We cannot open that. So ultimately we decline your proposal because it was not PDF. So this is really, really key in uh, key information to keep in mind, use the PDF. Do not use any third party PDF builders, all the Microsoft had existing capability to convert the PDF. And I will show you how to do that and you need to do that and keep in mind one key information that all of your documents, doesn't matter anything you are submitting as a part of your package, application package, all has to be PDF. Otherwise we do not have capacity to read. They just get dropped off. So that's the key one. And then other formatting requirement, we see many proposals we have to decline because to be fair with the, each of the applicants, we need to 
uh, abide by the rules that we establish in our RFA. So keep in mind our margins one inch. Don't go for one and a half or one and a quarter inch. Do we measure all those things? Font no less than 12 point times New Roman. Any table and figures font no less than 11 point times New Roman. Line spacing 1.5. Do not go double line spacing or single line spacing. Format, as I said, should be only PDF, no other file formatting allowed. And also the two other biggest component that project summary has to be 250 words, not more than that, that's one. And then second is page limit for your project narrative. It should be only 17 pages for a new application. For a uh, resubmission, it could be 18 pages. So very, very important. Now, how do you create that PDF? I said that you do not need to use any of the format. Once you go to the Microsoft Word file, you will see that upper left corner, click on there, and then it will come back, save as Adobe PDF. Click on save as Adobe PDF, your document will be converted to PDF. Any of the Word document, any of uh, Excel or anything you want to create a PDF, that's the way to do it. Just click on file, find out the Microsoft top menu file, convert save as Adobe PDF, it will be automatically done. I hope this is easy, everyone can do that. And do not take the risk not having any PDF file. Make sure that all of your files are in PDF form. Now, uh, we do not have much of the time, so I'm, I'm sure that our uh, RFA will be published sometimes in July. We are really hoping that uh, in next two weeks, we'll get that uh, publication, RFA published. So I'm hoping that you started way early. Usually we say that, start one year to deadline, start preparing for all the registration that we covered today, uh, reach out the SBRS TTR program, think about right fit of your research to the, our topic area, and then secure your partners and contractors four months to the deadline, get all the letters of support that you need for your application, um, two months before the deadline, truly review the RFA and start writing your application. Check out all the requirements that we have listed in the RFA. One week to deadline, submit your application to avoid any last minute technical issue because we see a lot of technical issues um, in the grants.gov in the last day. So don't wait for the last day. If you think about the application award timeline, uh, usually July is our solicitation release that the RFA, I'm telling that we are expecting any time. Our program coordinator in, in this call, she will be able to tell us at the end. Uh, but we are hoping that sometimes in July, we are uh, expecting our RFA to be published. And then September or October would be our proposal deadline. Keep in mind, Always our submission time is 5 p.m. Eastern time as a deadline. If you exceed 5.01, your, your application will not be accepted. Hey, Peter, let me, let me share meeting. a story here. True sure. story. Go ahead. Where a entrepreneur waited through no other reason other than procrastination, you know, changing a word here, a word there until the last day, you know, thinking that this application had to be perfect. 4.30 Eastern time rolls around, getting ready to submit it. And all of a sudden there's a thunderstorm and there's no power. Well, don't fall in that trap. You know, submit your application, you know, anywhere from a week to a, no later than two days before the deadline. So if any glitches do come up, you can address them and you can still get your application submitted on time. Oh, thank you. Thank you for emphasizing this, Dave, and sharing your story. So keep in mind about the deadline. If you are ready, submit it early. If you are thinking that some other tweak you have been done uh, and want to submit the updated one, feel free to do that because we actually accept the last one before the 5 p.m. So if you have submitted twice or three times, it's okay. We'll just consider one, the last one within that timeline. Uh, November to January, these are the NIFA peer review process gonna go away, uh, going on um, for the review and award notification. And then if you are successful, award can be start in July uh, for your funded projects. That's the timeline. So thinking about that review happened, decision make and then if you have your award 
notification, congratulations, you can plan working on your funded project. If not, I, I think that it is still, you get the valuable information from the peer review panel, feedback that you can tweak that, make that response, and next year, please resubmit. Resubmission would be really good for you because we have put a lot of work retweaking, making it better, um, increase your chances to be successful. And don't feel bad if you are not successful. Think about only 15% success rate for our phase one. So it is really competitive. But I really encourage you to take all the feedback and comments from the peer review panel and make a little stronger your application for the next round. So key points to remember, provide a vision. Probably um, um, they covered it, most of that. What is the market opportunity? Provide that in your vision. Sell the importance of your project uh, and then how it is aligned with the USDA priorities. Provide a detailed experimental plan. Uh, provide insight of the commercial potential. For your phase one, you don't have to do a full potential of the commercial market, but some sort of vision of how you see that is coming in terms of commercialization. Show connectivity with the communities, how this project will be benefited your communities or end users. So advice, some of the advice, I'm gonna repeat the same thing that we have done many times. Contact your topic area national program leader for a consult if you have any question. Follow the application guideline for formatting, page limits, and required documents. Ensure that your application responds to all review criteria listed in the RFA. So it, it becomes easier for the reviewer to review your application. And most of all, and most important, one thing to keep in your mind, read the RFA, request for application. That has all the answers that we will be needing. Now I'm gonna say, uh, share with you a couple other resources quickly so you are aware of those. NIFA grant application guide, I provided a link it here and we will be posting the webinar and recorded, uh, recorded webinar and the slides in the website in 20 business days. So you will have that. NIFA grant application guide is a um, secondary materials after RFA that is really useful to uh, once you are writing your application. We have a website and there is a frequent asked question. A lot of applicants ask different questions and the, some questions are very common for the applicant, applicant perspective. Look at those um, applicants' questions and find that we have answered them. You will find in our website different template, tools, and other resources. Also the applicant, USD has been application tutorial and other resource to be aware. Now, if you are new on the SBI program and thinking that, oh my goodness, there are a lot of things, how I'm going to do that, you are not alone. You do have a lot of resources assistance. There are small business development center, and we know that at least one small business development center in each state, actually total 62 SBDC are existing now, they provide support to small business applying for SBI STTR grants. So, Please click on this link, find out your state and who um, contact with them uh, for getting some additional help. There is also a FAST program. It's called Federal and State Technology Partnership Program. Um, so they also help disadvantages people or socially economically disadvantaged individuals, women or small business in underrepresented areas, typically in rural areas, they also provide some help. So please get those resources and uh, make use of those resources. Those are free. Other additional resources, I'm gonna say that USD SBR STTR program staff would always like to help you. You can attend our information session. If July we publish the RFA, we'll do another RFA technical webinar at the end of July or early August. So keep in, uh, keep your eye on our website. We'll also remind you when we will do that. That will be an informative session for you. Uh, you can schedule a one-to-one -one meeting with the national program leaders and contact our NPL or national program leader to discuss that topic area project fit. What other resources you have? Uh, other resources could be SCORE is a good one I saw. They help business mentors in your area uh, to attend internet and Entrepreneurship Workshop. So that's that's a good one. Please uh, check it out, www.score.org. Also, we contacted with an organization named ICF Next. They are really helpful. 
uh, they help to connect potential applicant with an organization that will guide small business through a step-by-step -step process for their SBRST tier application. I provided a QR code. Uh, you can use this resource to start discussion with the ICF Next and get some help. Finally, this is our website, www.nifausda.gov slash SBIR, our program email. If you have any question, feel free to email us at sbir at usda.gov. And here are the contact person. Melinda Kaufman is in background. I know that she has been answering a lot of your questions. <laughs> Melinda, do you want to say hi to everyone? Hi, excuse any typos I have in there. I'm sure there are some, so please forgive me. I asked a couple of people to save their questions for the um, open Q&A because they're easier to answer. Sure. Okay, let's say we are a little bit behind, but uh, we will start going for those. Now, I need to say that a USD is an equal opportunity provider, employer, and lender. Additional details are included on this slide and a link to USDA non-discrimination statement, fibroid compliance, and filing discrimination complaints. We encourage our audience members to reference this slide if you have any questions or concerns. So we really thank you. Thank you for attending our webinar. And I know that Melinda gone through a lot of question and answer. A uh, little bit of time we have, we're going to see if we can uh, answer any of those questions. If not, we'll follow up with those questions through email. I know one question I remember right off the top is someone asked um, if you can apply with the same project, the same proposal to multiple um, federal grant programs. So, for instance, for multiple SBIR, STTR programs. And the answer to that is you can, however, you have to declare it. Um, and when you when you uh, apply to our, our program, you have to declare that you have. And most importantly, I, am, I have to say that if you are offered more than one award, you may only, ex for the same project, you may only accept one. So you'll have to turn down um, a second award if it's offered. And if you don't, if you accept both, it can mean federal prison in your future. So we don't want that. So um, yeah, so that's very important. That's why I wanted to answer that on top. And then somebody asked if there was, and feel free to jump in, um, uh, if tissue culture was a, a, a project involving tissue culture was appropriate. And I ask, sure. but yeah, thank you. Yeah, tissue, tissue culture with the plant, that would be good feed for our 8.2. Well, I can address that. My, my background sure, is ahead. plant tissue culture. So it just depends upon the topic area where it could be 8.2 if you're involved with like gene editing or, or GMOs, it could be, 8.1, if you're working on tissue culture of trees, it, you know, there's a variety of different uh, areas. So again, if you're interested, um, feel free to reach out to me to talk about plant tissue culture or anyone else for any topic area that you are uh, interested in learning more about. Right, thank I you. Also okay, one, wanted, I also just wanted- Melinda, one quick- Sure, I, I am seeing and kind of a highlighting one. One person asked, does request for TABA funding strengthen or weaken the SBRS TTL application? I really want to answer that. Okay. Technical and business assistant TABA funding is free almost for you if you ask. 6,500, uh, that $6,500 for your phase one, you could use for any sort of assistant, right? For technical and business assistant cover a lot of different scenarios. So it is always strengthening your program and you should ask for it. It is almost free money. Do not think that asking that one, we can use one or it exceed the budget. It is not, it is on top of your budget. Go ahead, Melinda. Um, and I just wanted to explain, I know a lot of you already know this, but there are 11 SBIR programs across the federal government. Some of the larger ones, we're right in the middle. Some of the larger ones like DOD, for instance, is the largest and they have multiple SBIR programs within DOD. 
you know, the Air Force has one, the Army has one, that type of thing. So, um, so there are lots of opportunities out there. And so um, I just want to make sure that was clear. I think I've missed a question that someone asked. Um, and I can't find it. <laughs> so. Anyone would like to unmute themselves and ask question if you think that your question is not answered. But as I said, I'll, I'll copy all of your question. And if I see that we have not answered you, we'll email all of our registrants with the link of webinar and then also um, answer your questions there. Um, I have a question, if I may. Um, can you hear me well? Yeah, yes, um, please go ahead. You mentioned that a CRADA could be um, the tiebreaker between two applications. And so in the case that we might not necessarily need a lab specifically from a federal agency, but we would greatly benefit from the expertise uh, from someone at a federal agency, would that count uh, for a CRADA agreement um, if it's more like an advisor and mentorship situation? Well, a CRADA is a, a formal agreement. So it is a, an agreement, a sheet of paper. Um, mm -hmm. And so I would encourage you to consider that first. Um, you know, there, there might be other ways to tie in with a, a federal lab, you know, through mm -hmm. a, a subcontract perhaps, but, but I would strongly encourage a, a CRADA. And federal researchers are encouraged to do CRADAs, by the way. It looks good in their career advancement. Okay, I guess I'm not completely understanding if this needs to be like a physical space or it can be something else. I think that was my question. But I, I think maybe you said it had. A, a CRADA um, agreement, if you're interested, if anyone is interested in that, they can email me. My email is on the slides and I'll connect you with the Agricultural Research Service Office of Technology Transfer. And there, my understanding is you fill out a one page form to quickly. Um, determine whether there might be a match between your project and a federal lab. And then if there is, from there you go on to build the credit agreement, which can either go very quickly or it can take up to six months. Yeah. It just depends on the details. And, and I can comment on, in terms of my experience, when I had a small company, when when I had a, a credit with Oak Ridge, with a credit, everything's negotiable. Everything is. I negotiated space in Oak Ridge to conduct the work. So just keep in mind with agreements, everything is negotiable. Okay, thank you. That's, that's super helpful. I'll follow up with you, Melinda. Great. All right, I think that we, we are a little bit over with our yes. time. So thank you. Thank you so much everyone for joining. I'm hoping that this uh, informative session is helpful to write an application. I uh, will follow up with any question that we did not have answered, but please feel free to reach out any of us. But if you have a general question, email us at sbir.gov.us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.